Coming up on Arirang News. Japan announces it'll proceed with the wastewater release from its wrecked Fukushima nuclear power plant as early as Thursday, despite objections at home and from neighboring countries. The South Korean government views the discharge as having no scientific or technical problems, but notes it'll request an immediate suspension if the release does not go as planned. The IAEA will remain stationed in a Fukushima office and will publish real-time monitoring data. North Korea notifies Japan that it plans to launch another satellite in the coming days, less than three months after its first attempt failed. This amid joint military drills by Seoul and Washington. Good evening. It's 9 p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. We start with what is now Japan's imminent release of wastewater from the wrecked Fukushima nuclear power plant into the ocean. Tokyo has announced that it'll start discharging the wastewater this Thursday, despite criticism from local fishing groups and nearby countries. More than a million tons will be released into the Pacific over the next 30 years. Peunji leads us off. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has said the country will go forward with the release of wastewater on Thursday, August 24th, if they encounter no obstacles. A total of about 1.3 million tons of wastewater will be discharged from the destroyed nuclear power plant in Fukushima into the Pacific Ocean over the next three decades. The decision was made after the Japanese government held a cabinet meeting on Tuesday morning to discuss the issue. As for the specific release date, it is expected to be August 24th, weather and sea conditions permitting. Announcing the plan, Prime Minister Kishida said he believes there has been support and understanding from a wide range of regions and countries, based on scientific evidence from the International Atomic Energy Agency. The IAEA, the United Nations nuclear watchdog, approved the discharge last month, saying that it finds the plans to be consistent with international safety standards. Prime Minister Kishida also asked the operator of the power plant, Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, to prepare for the discharge swiftly. In response, TEPCO said it has begun the preparations needed, starting with the transfer of the first batch of treated water from storage tanks into a facility on Tuesday morning. The company said it expects a total of 31,200 tons to be discharged by next March, and explained that this is about 3 percent of the total amount. TEPCO plans to use a purification system called the ALPS to remove radioactive materials with the exception of tritium that's difficult to separate from water. It will then mix with seawater to dilute it before releasing into the ocean through an underwater pipe that's about one kilometer long. Japan's latest decision comes just days after the leaders of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan held a historic summit as Seoul and Tokyo worked to resolve historical disputes and restore ties. Meanwhile, some Japanese media outlets have suggested that the reason Kishida is eyeing an early release within this month is to avoid the fishing season in Fukushima, which begins in September. It's been about two years since the Japanese government first announced its decision to discharge the water into the Pacific Ocean as storage space was running out. And it has been around 12 years since the Fukushima nuclear power plant was destroyed by a massive tsunami and earthquake on March 11, 2011. Peung Arirang News. The South Korean government views the planned Fukushima wastewater release as having no scientific or technical issues, but it notes that it'll request an immediate suspension if things do not go as planned. Seoul also announces plans aimed at protecting, protecting the safety and health of people in Korea amid concerns at home. Choi min -jung reports. With Japan set to proceed with the release of Fukushima wastewater as soon as Thursday, the South Korean government has determined that there are no scientific or technical problems with the planned discharge. Speaking at a briefing on Tuesday afternoon, the first deputy chief of the Office for Government Policy Coordination, Park goo stressed that this, however, does not mean that the government accepts or supports the wastewater release. 
Our government concluded today that we'll ask Japan to immediately stop the discharge if the actual process goes differently from what was planned, as it would threaten the safety and health of our people. In order to enhance the transparency and reliability of the disposal, Park said South Korea has consulted with the IAEA and Japan about having Korean experts participate in the on-site inspection operated by the IAEA. The Korean government also asked Japan to immediately stop the release and notify the government if something unusual occurs. Lastly, South Korea has requested the sharing of real-time information for prompter transparent monitoring. In response, Japan, in coordination with the IAEA, agreed to post relevant data online every hour with the information provided in Korean as well. To ease concerns, the government announced its future plans aimed at protecting the safety and health of people in Korea. As we have done so far, our government will focus on the health and safety of the people and respond transparently and promptly while doing our best to minimize damage to fishers and the fisheries industry. First, the government plans to significantly expand the scope of monitoring to include the waters near the Pacific Islands and the Northwest Pacific near Japan. Authorities also vow to expand simulations using actual data obtained after the release to reflect what's really going on. The government has been judging that the impact of the release on domestic waters and marine products will not be significant. This comes as results from various simulations have shown that radioactive substances from the wastewater would flow into Korean waters several years later in a considerably diluted state. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. The International Atomic Energy Agency vows to maintain an on-site presence at Fukushima Daiichi and monitor the situation during and after releasing the water. Amid a mixed reaction from the international community, some expressing strong opposition. Shin Ha-young has the details. The International Atomic Energy Agency will review the situation during and after the discharge of Fukushima wastewater. Following the announcement by the Japanese government on Tuesday, the IAEA published a statement on its website saying that its staff on site will continue to monitor and assess the activities to ensure their ongoing alignment with safety standards, including on the day of the discharge starting and after. The agency has staff stationed in a Fukushima office that was opened last month, where South Korea will also send its experts. The IAEA experts there will directly observe the process of collecting wastewater samples. While regularly visiting related facilities, they will coordinate discussions between the IAEA and Tokyo Electric Power Company if any changes occur. It also plans to publish data for the use of the global community, including real-time monitoring information. An additional update will be provided as soon as the discharge begins. Unlike the United States, which has been supportive of the discharge, China has criticized Japan's latest decision. China strongly urges Japan to rectify its wrongful decision and withdraw its plan to discharge nuclear contaminated water into the sea. A Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson added that Beijing will take necessary measures to safeguard food safety and the health of its people. Hong Kong Chief Executive John Lee on Tuesday said he strongly opposes the decision, saying the city would immediately activate import controls on Japanese seafood. On the other hand, the European Union last month decided to remove its import restrictions on Japanese food that had been in place since the nuclear accident in 2011. Meanwhile, the environmental organization Greenpeace has criticized Japan's latest decision, arguing that it violates human rights in both Japan and the Pacific region and that it ignores the concerns of people, including fishermen. Shin Na-yong, Arirang News. North Korea notifies Japan that it plans to launch another satellite sometime between this Thursday and the end of this month, less than three months after its first attempt failed. This amid joint military drills by Seoul and Washington and the regime marking its 75th founding anniversary next month. Our Ideon reports. North Korea will likely launch a satellite between August 24th and 31st in the direction of the West Sea. The Japanese Coast Guard said that Pyongyang gave a notification early on Tuesday saying that it will designate three marine danger zones. These zones will include two areas in the West Sea and the eastern part of the Philippines' Pacific coast. 
Kyodo News reported that the planned launch seems to be a retry of Pyongyang's military reconnaissance satellite launch in May. North Korea had notified Japan about that launch on May 29th and launched a satellite two days after that, but it failed as the rocket fell into the West Sea minutes after launch. North Korea's Aerospace Development Administration said that the newly built engine and fuel that have been used to launch the rocket were the reasons for the failure and pledged to try again soon. Experts say that May's launch was possibly affected by political issues as there could have been pressure for North Korea to succeed in putting the satellite into orbit ahead of the so-called Victory Day in July. This could indicate that North Korea has figured out the reason for the previous failure, so we might want to keep an eye on that. Pyongyang might have also targeted the Seoul-Washington joint military drills. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has reportedly ordered officials to finish the technological preparation for a military spy satellite as one of the regime's top priorities for the second half of the year. South Korea's National Intelligence Service earlier last week said that the satellite will likely be launched in late August or early September to celebrate National Foundation Day next month. Meanwhile, following the notice, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida reportedly called on related ministries to cooperate in gathering information and said that Tokyo will closely work with Seoul and Washington on the matter. The Japanese Coast Guard has also issued an alert to warn seafarers. South Korea's Unification Ministry also condemned Pyongyang's plan, saying it is a clear violation of the UN Security Council resolutions. It also urged North Korea to immediately withdraw the plan. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. In more than three and a half years, North Korea's first international commercial flight has landed in Beijing. On Tuesday, the Air Korea flight departed Pyongyang Sunan International Airport and arrived at Beijing Capital International Airport. Although it's unknown whether any passengers were on board, it's been suggested that officials from North Korea's embassy in Beijing could be on the flight as the embassy car was reportedly parked at the airport. A flying returning back to Pyongyang also appeared on the airport screen board, scheduled at 1.05 p.m. The exact number of passengers is unknown, but there was reportedly a long line of North Korean passengers to take the flight back to Pyongyang. Now in Moscow, airports in the Russian capital were briefly closed on Monday after spotting a drone flying over the capital. Choi soo has the latest. All airports in the Russian capital were temporarily closed on Monday local time as a drone was spotted over Moscow. The drone is believed to have been shut down on the outskirts of the city. According to Reuters and TASS News, a suspected unmanned aerial vehicle from Ukraine threw Moscow's airports into chaos, resulting in delays for all outgoing and incoming flights. Russia's defense ministry claimed that the drone was shut down, while Ukraine did not immediately comment on the incident. Meanwhile, during a visit to Denmark, Ukraine's President Zelensky stated on Monday local time at the Copenhagen Parliament that he is confident of Ukraine's victory. Dear friends, today we are confident that Russia will lose this war. The main thing is what we prove with our victory, with our cooperation, what you prove supporting Ukraine. On August 20th, Denmark and the Netherlands jointly announced they would support Ukraine with F-16 fighter jets as soon as certain conditions such as pilot training are met. Denmark revealed plans to provide a total of 19 aircraft, including six starting at the end of this year, with a further eight in 2024 and five in 2025. Meanwhile, Russia's ambassador to Denmark, Vladimir Babin, said that Denmark's decision would further escalate the conflict. Russia's foreign minister also warned that Moscow considers F-16 fighter jets a nuclear threat. Chess Young, Arirang News. With ever-increasing occurrences of brutal crimes in South Korea, authorities are coming up with measures to stop them and expand support for victims. Also, they're pushing to create special prisons for serious felons. Our political correspondent Yi shi has more. As South Korea grapples with a series of violent crimes targeting random victims, the government and the ruling People Par Party have proposed measures to respond to these senseless acts aimed at preventing them. Lawmakers, the National Police Agency and officials from various ministries, including Justice and Health, came together on Tuesday and announced a three-part plan that also aimed at prioritizing the needs of the victims of such violence. 
These measures are aimed at providing assistance and help for the victims. The plan is to expand support for the victims, prevent violent crimes and strengthen the punishment of those convicted. A so-called one-stop support service center will be established as soon as possible to provide comprehensive support for the victims and their family members suffering from physical and emotional trauma. There will also be expanded financial support for medical treatment. Victims can currently receive 15 million Korean won or around 11,000 U.S. dollars per year, up to a total of 50 million won or around 37,000 dollars over several years. They can receive additional support following a special review by the government. Now the government and the PPP are looking to provide more of such additional support, possibly covering all necessary expenses. To prevent such violent crimes, measures will be drawn up to hospitalize those with psychiatric disorders who are at risk of harming themselves or others. More collaborative response centers will be set up nationwide by police and regional administrations. Additionally, more surveillance cameras will be installed in high-risk neighborhoods. The government will also push to introduce life sentences without the chance of parole, as well as increase the sentences for serious crimes by at least six months and possibly up to two years or more. A special prison will be designated for serious felons with tighter restrictions and controls. In addition, the National Assembly will push legislation for the punishment of those threatening people with lethal weapons in public places and expand the release of photos of suspects along with their personal information. Also discussed was the possible easing of restrictions on the use of force by police facing suspected violent criminals. The meeting followed President Yoon Song yeols order on Monday for Prime Minister Han Duk su to come up with measures to deal with the violent crime wave. Lee si hu Arirang News. President Yoon suk yeol has announced new names for key positions, and this includes a minister to lead in promoting the nation's export policies, hoping to boost the economy. In addition, with the current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court leaving in a month, he has nominated a conservative-leaning judge to the court. Our Kim do yeon has the details. President Yoon on Tuesday nominated former Minister of Office for Government Policy Coordination Pang moon Gyu as his new Minister of Trade, Industry and Energy. Pang, a career civil servant in the country's treasury and finance sectors, has served in a number of key roles including the CEO of the Export-Import Bank of Korea. In amidst rapid changes in the global economy, uncertainties have grown in our economy's trade and investment environment, as well as in energy and resource policies. In times like these, I believe that strategic industrial policies are crucial. Replacing him as the OPC minister will be Pang gi Sun, who currently serves as the first vice minister of economy and finance. According to an official at the top office, both coming from the finance ministry underscores the government's main focus of reviving the economy, with diplomacy and security issues being considered somewhat settled following the Camp David Trilateral Summit. Earlier the same day, the president nominated a new chief justice for the Supreme Court. Lee Gyun Young, a career judge, served at various courts, including the Seoul Central District Court and the Gwangju High Court. E, according to reports citing his past words and decisions, is regarded as a conservative. His appointment is subject to a National Assembly confirmation hearing, followed by a vote during a plenary session. If voted in, he will take up the position on September 24th, when the current Chief Justice Kim myung sus term ends. This judge has stood at the forefront of advancing the rights of vulnerable members of society, particularly through rulings that greatly expand the rights of people with disabilities, with a recognition for his contributions to disability rights. The presidential office also announced four vice ministerial appointments, including Kim hyung yeol as the commissioner of the National Agency for Administrative City Construction. The change had been anticipated after investigations revealed that the Osong underpass flooding, which left 14 dead in July, was partly due to construction work led by the agency at a nearby riverbank. Meanwhile, as for the Korea Communications Commission Chief Lee dong confirmation, a presidential official said a re-request will be made on Tuesday for a new deadline, with the assembly failing to come up with a report by Monday. If the second deadline is also missed, the president can proceed with the nominee's appointment. 
김도연 아리랑 뉴스. Seoul Metro will be introducing unlimited subway passes for the conveniences of foreign tourists, the numbers of which have been increasing with the removal of COVID-19 restrictions. Announced by the operator of the Seoul subway system on Sunday, the new passes allowing unlimited travel are expected to be issued before the end of the year. Considering that around 37% of foreign tourists stay in the city for an average of four to seven days, the new passes are expected to be offered as either one-day or three-day passes, priced at around $4 and $9 respectively. The unlimited subway passes will also be available for local residents. Shifting gears, electronic devices we use in our daily lives put out low-frequency electromagnetic waves that amass in our bodies. And now a domestic research team has found a way to collect the electric energy that passes through our body as a means of treatment. Lee Eun-jin tells us more. Electronics that we use in our daily lives, like smartphones and laptops, all emit electromagnetic waves. The energy from these devices finally accumulate in our bodies and is transmitted upon contact. A team of South Korean researchers have developed technology that uses this concept to vitalize cells in the body. Attaching a localized electric field concentrates the energy to the desired area. The electric energy is focused to where the electric field is desired, so external electric energy stimulates internal physiological activities. The research team attached an electric field device to a person's legs, and while exposed to the electrical energy, moved the leg muscles. Results showed the muscle fatigue decreased by 6.4 percent. When the electrical energy stimulates the muscle cells, muscle strength is enhanced, while muscle fatigue is reduced. Now, when this technology was integrated into material used for sportswear, similar effects of the electrical energy stimulation was seen. The energy from electronic devices is at low frequencies, so it passes through without significant effect on the human body. But collecting this electrical energy can cause electrical cell stimulation. This means that without using a separate battery or wires, a simple electric field patch could allow people to take advantage of electrical energy stimulation in their daily lives. The research team has also noticed the effect of energy concentration vitalizing cells on the skin as well as on the scalp, which could mean future electric energy use for the treatment of scars and hair loss. Lee Eun-jin, Arirang News. A low-pressure system will likely dominate much of South Korea tomorrow, producing nationwide rain. For northern Gyeonggi the province and mountainous regions of Jeju Island, heavy downpours of up to 150 millimeters are expected. For Seoul and remainder of western central regions, up to 120 millimeters are in the forecast. Chungcheongdo and Jeolla the province will see 30 to 80 millimeters. Local downpours of 30 to 60 millimeters per hour will lash some regions. The ground will get saturated over time due to continuous rainfall. Be extra careful of landslides. And for those across low-lying regions, flooding is also possible. Despite the cold showers, tropical nights will continue for some regions. Seoul and Daegu will be starting off at 25 degrees. As for the daily highs, Seoul will get up to 27, Gwangju 29, Gyeongju will be sweltering at 34 degrees. Expect frequent rainfall for the next few days. With the rain, central regions will take a brief respite from the extreme heat. That's all for now, and here are the weather conditions around the world. That is all for tonight's newscast. Thank you for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with the most up-to-date news. Good night.